Presenting the PR Maven podcast, hosted by Nancy Marshall, the PR Maven, targeted at business leaders who want to merge the best techniques of traditional networking with the best new platforms and technologies to engage your target audience, build your network, and grow your brand and business. The podcast is sponsored by Marshall Communications, Maine based, globally connected. As we get ready for another great episode, remember you can always connect with Nancy and other listeners on the PR Maven Nation group page on Facebook. Now, Here's your host, Nancy Marshall. So today we're here at the Governor's Conference on Tourism at the Augusta Civic Center in Augusta, Maine with Steve Lyons. And Steve, what is your goal with this annual conference? Well, the goal of the annual conference is really fourfold. It keeps people informed about the successes we've had in their past marketing programs. We put forth a program that will help businesses themselves um, better market themselves and maybe learn some new things that they can be more efficient and more effective in what they're doing as a marketing in marketing their own businesses and it help we also want to help people understand that in order to attract today's traveler they've got to start thinking out of the box a little bit you can't just be the vanilla you know vacation that everyone else offers you've got to find ways to develop that experience and i guess lastly the fourth part of that i guess would be how do you collaborate how do you get people in this state who are all ultimately trying to get to the same goal of bringing visitors to the state to collaborate to make that more effective? Yes, that's uh, something called coopetition, I think, right? <laughs> when you're, you're cooperating, but in a way you're competing too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what happens a lot of times and what we see frequently in, in my day-to-day work with the tourism office is that you often have three or four organizations all with the same sort of ultimate end goal, but they have a slightly different way of getting there, yet they still don't find a way to work together. And so if we can find a way to get those people to come together and be more collaborative, then everybody will benefit. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely all ships will rise with the tide, as they say. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's certainly the ultimate goal with, with all of this. I mean, more people can get to visit the state, the better of it better off it is for the economy and and all of that. That's right. Well, you now lead the Maine Office of Tourism, whose primary job is to market the entire state of Maine to potential visitors. Tell me about your career and how you got into marketing in the first place. Well, I I like to say I've been in tourism my entire life. I was born in 1962, and that's the year my father became the first tourism director for the state of Vermont. And so ever since I was born... I basically was growing up in the tourism industry. And so all the jobs he had, uh, or all all the work that he did over that 29-year career that he had as tourism director in the state of Vermont, I kind of heard the dinnertime conversation and got to go to a few of the events with him occasionally and and, uh, those kinds of things. So it was always sort of something I grew up with, I guess. And then after I graduated from college, I I had a degree in marketing from a state college in Vermont. And after I did that, I, my, I worked for a car rental company for a first six months and doesn't, wasn't really crazy about that. Um, but then I uh, left that and was looking for another job in the tourism industry. And my father said, well, I've got a meeting with the president of Stowe Ski Resort. I could just mention that you're looking for something. And, and so he called the president of Stowe Ski Resort. And the president said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Have him send me my resume. Have him send me your resume. And send it to me, not the human resources department. And so at that time, I really didn't have any experience aside from my college degree um, and maybe six months working for that car rental company. And so, um, you know, maybe it was a year. Uh, and so <laughs> we... He told the president, the president hired me on as sort of a temporary person to do ski reports. Um, So I started doing the ski reports. I think I started in March. So the season was winding down at that point. And then I figured, well, at least it's a temporary gig. Maybe I'll find something after that. It'll at least give me a paycheck until I find something else. And then slowly it kept expanding into something else. And I started doing events. I started doing PR. I started doing other marketing programs and such on mountain sales shows. And it turned out that I ended up working at Stowe for five years in their marketing office. And so it was great experience. Um, Anyone who's worked in the marketing industry or the ski industry in marketing at the entry level job knows it probably didn't pay a heck of a lot. Um, But it was great experience. I learned a lot of different things. And so that's kind of where I started. And then from there, 
after working five years for six different marketing directors in five years at the ski resort and seeing that no one ever got promoted from within, I moved on and um, decided, well, I got to look for something else. So I went, took a journey um, to find myself, I guess. <laughs> I went out and I spent a summer in Glacier National Park um, in Montana. And I waited tables at Glacier Park Lodge for the summer. Um, loved it, had a great time, did some great hiking, uh, met some interesting people from all over the country. And after that gig ended um, in the fall, and the day I was leaving Glacier National Park was like mid-October, I was leaving in a snowstorm, and I said, well, I'm going to go out even further west. And so I went to Portland, Oregon. And I worked in Portland, Oregon for about a year, working a uh, front desk for a hotel out there. And um, the whole time I was working front desk for the hotel, I was looking for other marketing jobs and didn't have much success out there. So I ended up coming back east. Uh, my brother was getting married. One of my brothers was getting married in New Hampshire. And so I came back to be in the wedding and then just stayed once I got back and, and started looking for work in this area. So trying to think how it went from there. I mean, I, I waited tables um, for a period of time at Basin Harbor Club in Vermont after I got back, which is a great little resort on Lake Champlain. Um, and then not too long afterwards, I got a temporary stint. Um, this was after my father retired at the Vermont Department of Tourism doing some PR work, um, kind of media relations work. At that time, I was kind of um, writing press releases, fulfilling media requests, that kind of thing did that for, I think, six months on a temporary position. And then eventually um, got a job working marketing at Mount Cranmore in New Hampshire. Uh, Mount Cranmore at that time had gone bankrupt and it was being run by the bank. And the bank was looking for, obviously, a way to show that this is a viable property so they could sell it to somebody else and another investor. And so they hired a general manager, he hired a marketing director, and the marketing director also happened to be uh, the publisher of a local newspaper. And so they hired me on as a marketing manager. The marketing director couldn't do both jobs, so I became the marketing director for a season until the resort got sold, and then they brought in their own staff. And so, and after that, where did I go? I think I went back to Vermont for a period of time, and I was out of this tourism industry for about two years, working for a company called Hearthstone, which was uh, focusing on manufacture of wood and gas stoves, um, and did that for two years in the sales and marketing office. And then, lo and behold, the job for the main tourism office came up, and I applied for that, and uh, been here ever since. Well, wow, that's a great story. And, you know, we were probably working in the ski industry at, back in the 80s at the same time because I was at Sugarloaf, you know, started in the marketing department there in 84. Yeah. And was there until about 91. So that's probably yeah. about the same time you were yeah, at I was Stowe. Yeah, I was at Stowe from 88 to 93. That's okay, when I was yeah. There. And then it was 93, I went out to Montana, and 94 out in Oregon. Yeah, yep. Well, and I, I believe, like like you said, you don't make a lot of money, but you also have a crash course in guerrilla marketing because even if you have a title, you're wearing every hat. I mean, I remember yeah. I had to go out in the parking lot and count cars. I don't know if you ever did that. Yeah, but. I did that. <laughs> yeah, counting cars you know, count at competing resorts, too. Did you ever oh, do that? Oh, yeah, yep. I, I went down to <laughs> yeah. Sunday River, yeah, with my clipboard. and yeah. Not only counting the number of cars, but where they came from. Yeah, I was yeah. doing that. I remember going to Okemo in the parking lot, wandering around, you know, and when I worked at Stowe and Killington and wherever else I went, I don't remember. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> I wonder if they still do that or if they can t somehow do it, take a picture or send drones out. <laughs> I don't know. It's probably, they probably still do it that way. I mean, I'm not quite sure how else you would do it. Yeah. You know, yeah, we'll have to ask somebody. I just remember it being a, it wasn't a bad job, but it was nice, but it was one of those cold days. You didn't want to be wandering around the parking lot necessarily. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, we were taught we could never complain about the cold because we were in the <laughs> ski business and... You know, if it's cold, that's a good thing because that means the snow is going to yeah. last. <laughs> yeah, I do remember one time it was so cold that, you know, every now and then when a travel writer would come, you'd have to escort them up on the mountain. And, and typically I kept, when I went skiing, I typically wore my contact lenses because, you know, how it works with glasses. You freeze up and that kind of thing. Well, that day, I, it must have been 
10 degrees or zero or something. It was pretty chilly. And I didn't wear my contacts because I really wasn't planning on skiing that day. But I just remember going up on the mountain with this travel rider and skiing down North Slope, I think it was. And I'm thinking, without my glasses on, because my glasses froze up. I, my, my breathing, I had a mask on and stuff, so my glasses froze up. And, uh, <laughs> and I just remember taking them off and saying, well, forget this, it's not working. So I put my glasses in my pocket, and so I'm skiing the mountain, and I'm nearsighted. So, you know, it's kind of like, oh, there's a bump, oh, there's a bump, oh, there's a bump. I made it, didn't fall, but it was, it was, uh, it was quite an experience. Yeah, right. <laughs> Did you remember who that writer was? I, I don't, no. It was like, <laughs> it would be funny yeah, it was to like ask 30 years ago, I don't remember who. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that was, for me, that was just a great way to start in, in my career. And I, I feel like now doing public relations and the tourism business, I kind of know what it's like in the trenches. <laughs> yeah, it does help a lot. I mean, those, those entry-level jobs, you really can't beat them. I mean, it's a great way to get, you know, like you said, a crash course. I mean, you, you know, you're not going to learn that in a textbook. You know, you're not going to learn that. You just have to kind of go out and do it and make it up as you go along sometimes. When I think back, I, I was in charge of the little cable TV station at Sugarloaf, and I would have to go in, and there was no cameraman. I was the cameraman and the talent, and I'd have to put a, a three-quarter inch tape, turn the camera on, run around, give the kid the report, and then put it in and, like, press broadcast, you know, go on the air, and then make photocopies of the ski resort and run around delivering the ski reports yeah. and come back. <laughs> So it's like, oh my God, I'm a one arm paper hanger. Yeah, I mean the ski the ski reports were always something always found kind of interesting. I did those for years, you know, every morning doing the ski report, both on the recorded snow phone that we had at the mountain, and I'd usually call a couple of radio stations and do live reports with them. And it was always found it interesting. I usually ended my reports the same way, you know, and you know, um, I was always like, and that's what it looks like today here in Stowe. You know, that's how I'd end my report pretty much every time. And, uh, you know, I ended up getting this following. I had, I had people, some of the Stowe hosts, which were volunteers that kind of traveled around the mountain and helped visitors and stuff, started calling me the voice of Stowe. Well, you do have a very good <laughs> broadcast voice as I'm sitting here listening to that. Oh, well, thank you. I do, do you hear ever have that. any broadcast training? or uh, No training, per se. I, did, uh, I had a college radio program for a couple of years when I was undergrad. Um, and so I did have... My, my show was a music show, usually kind of a mixed bag. It depended on what I felt like that day. That was the nice thing about college radio stations. You really didn't have a format to follow necessarily as long as you, you know, weren't playing rude stuff on the air. You were probably fine. So my show was music to do, whatever it is you happen to be doing by. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's very catchy. <laughs> yeah. And I did that for a couple of years. We should ask uh, the state's ad agency what they think about that <laughs> tagline. Yeah. Well, that, that, that goes along with one of the taglines my father made up and got a little trouble for one year. A lot goes on when the skis come off. Oh! <laughs> That's good. And, I like and that. 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 That didn't go over well with some of the, I think, the legislators or some oh, of the people. Oh, well, I like that. Cause but it, it wasn't meant to be what some people mean it to be. Right, but. yeah. <laughs> I like that. So, Steve, I like to talk about building personal brands in order to build the brand of an organization or a destination. How has the state of Maine incorporated the personalities of Maine people to build the brand of the destination? Well, the brand is based upon our core personal values, and what better way to present them than, than through real people? And obviously, the people that we're talking with, I mean, we, we do this all the time, with our, or we, with, for the, probably since 2012, when we started with our new ad agency, um, BBK, um, the focus was on the people of Maine and originality as our branding. Um, uh, as our branding, and what we found was that when you're dealing with real people, the nice thing about Maine and what makes sort of makes the Maine brand is that people are here. The people that live in Maine are doing what they're passionate about. That's why they're here. You've got lobstermen that have been doing it maybe for generations in their family. You've got people that work in the woods cutting trees or, you know, skidding, you know, working log skidders or whatever. They've been doing that. You've got farmers that are farming potatoes, whatever it happens to be, you know, artists doing their thing. And all these people are doing these things because they're passionate about them and they're making a living here in Maine doing that. You know, that can't be said for a lot of people in some of the cities and such where people are kind of just in, they're punching the clock, they're doing their nine to five, whatever. And, you know, I think that's part of what, you know, and we, we thought, well, this would be 
something that we should be capturing. Like the people are here because they want to be here. They're doing what they love, you know, and um, you know it really goes to their core personal values. I mean, it's it's the core personal value of an individual that makes them the person they are, and that makes them make the decisions that they make. <laughs> That's a lot of makes, <laughs> um, you know. But you know, so we decided that, that was important to try to capture that when we developed the brand. Yeah, well, I think it's a great campaign, obviously, and, and it's won multiple awards. So congratulations! It has, you know, and it, it's you know, we've been very fortunate um, with this campaign. It's, it's it has hit a you know hit a chord with people, I think, and you know, I think it, it goes to the fact that we spent a lot of time and effort um, identifying our core segments, you know, who we're going to target. Because you can market all day long to any kind of different audience and all kinds of different audiences, and there's no one way to market and no one audience to market to. Um, so, you know, we just happened to hit, I think, the right, um, you know, the right audience um, with our research, and it's been doing very well for us. Well, I think that's really critical, obviously, if you can, can connect with your targeted audiences in an authentic way and obviously that that's what you've done so yeah i think a, yeah. a strong brand not only attracts the right people but it also kind of repels the people that you don't necessarily want to come or you know might not be a good fit for your brand yeah i mean the the man the main brand all you have to do is go out we travel a lot to travel shows or travel around the world to various you know tourism conferences or or you know um you know travel trade shows and that kind of thing and it's always the same reaction oh Maine we love Maine I've never been to Maine but I love Maine you know or you know I mean it's people just seem to have this image in their head about this place that's different than a lot of other states you know I, I just you know I don't know what it is there's something inherent about Maine that makes people you know get all you know cloudy eyed and like oh wow this is great right. wow we love Maine and, and that's great it makes our job a little easier well it's it's what I say is that, you know, you do not necessarily control the main brand. The, the main brand really resi resides in the hearts and the minds of the targeted audience. So all those people that get all gooey-eyed and, <laughs> you know, talk about how much they love it, that is what the brand is. Oh, it so, is. So, I, I mean, mean by it's a beautiful means. thing. I mean, you know, we, we say it all the time in our office. It's like, I may have seen something a hundred times when I'm doing an ad campaign or whatever, and I'm like, oh, this really wouldn't attract me, but I'm not the audience, you know, and that's what we have to be, you know, be wary of when we're doing, when you're doing any kind of marketing. Like, I'm not the person you're trying to attract. I live here already. I work here already. You know, what I'm trying to do is get to people outside of the state who can come here and enjoy what we have to offer. <laughs> I kind of laugh because whenever I'm watching television with my 86-year-old mother and she doesn't like the images of television of scantily clad young women or other things she finds sort of <laughs> repulsive, I'm always saying, Mom, you are not the target audience. <laughs> and actually, these days, she knows that I'm going to say that, so <laughs> she'll say that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, Jeez. Steve, Maine has a strong brand because it is strongly differentiated from other places around the world. How has PR helped to build the brand? Well, paid media can only go so far. I mean, you only have a limited budget and you only have so much money to spend on buying an ad, a TV ad, a print ad, whatever, out of home, whatever it happens to be. And so PR has been very important in, in what we do um, as a state. Um, you know what? What I always, the way I always kind of describe PR is sort of like it's the third-party endorsement of your property. I mean, I'm the marketing guy. Now, obviously, as the marketing guy for the state, I'm going to say, "Hey, Maine's a great place. You ought to come visit. It's it's fantastic. You'll love it." Blah 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 blah. And and people take that with a grain of salt because that's blatantly commercial. Um, whereas PR is being told by a third party. It's being told by a travel journalist or an influencer, whoever it happens to be. And that person is telling it to their audience. Um, oftentimes, they have their own followings of people, you know, um, travel writers and stuff. And it's their perspective. So it's somebody else telling us what a great place we are, as opposed to me, the marketing guy, saying, hey, this is a great place to be. You know, because obviously, what else am I going to say? You know? So when you have a third party, um, you know, a journalist talking about Maine or writing about the story, um, what it does, it complements what we do for advertising or supplements maybe is a better word because, as I said, our core markets are New England, mid-Atlantic states, 
and Eastern Canada. And people think we do a lot of national advertising, but frankly, we don't have the budget to do a national campaign. We get, we get some national spillover, um, but for the most part, those are our three target markets. So with PR, you can then expand your marketing efforts out to other areas. You know, we went out to Chicago just recently with your office to uh, meet with some travel journalists. You know, um, that's not a market we advertise in, but it's an area, certainly an area that we can write stories about and get people to write stories about us. So I think it's very important. Yes, it is, and people find it credible, and it kind of goes along with the whole. Uh, idea of means, core personal values, and originality, because um, I think that's reflected in the PR, and it's it's authentic, and, and people find it credible. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, and and plus, you it's it's a great way to get to niche marketing too, because you can't afford to buy ads for golf and skiing and ATVing and snowmobiling and every other thing there is out there in the right. world, you know. So if you can have a, someone write a story about that, invite journalists here to experience that firsthand and then they can write about that. And then it's also, you know, the other advantage you get particularly with freelancers is that certainly they're, they're writing for many, many different publications or many different media outlets oftentimes. And so you get much more broad, uh, a broader distribution in, in, of your of your um, um, stories. Right, yeah. And a professional freelancer has to sell their stories to make a living, so they are motivated to sell the stories numerous times, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So I always think freelancers are a good good group of people to work with. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> by all means. So you and I have both been in the business of tourism marketing for several decades, even though you would never know it by looking at <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say, dearie? You <laughs> look so young. Uh, <laughs> How has PR and marketing changed over the course of your career, and what techniques are you using now that you were not using when you first started out? Well, I found this interesting. I was just asked um, by University of Southern Maine. They have a lifelong learning program. I spoke to them um, a couple weeks ago, and they sort of asked a similar question about what, how has marketing changed. I thought back about when my father was first doing it. I mean, that was when he started in 1962. That was almost 60 years ago. Um, and I thought about how he used to market the state. Back then, they called him, frankly, it wasn't tourism director at that time. He was actually called the, main, uh, the Vermont publicity director because at that point, and my father had a journalism background, and at that point, they were hiring people to do, to write press releases, essentially. So you write press releases, you take your black and white photos, and you send those out to the media, and hopefully you get the story gets picked up. What always cracked me up about that is even the fall foliage pictures were in black and white, because that's what you had back in the 1960s and 70s, you know. Um, so it's changed a lot, and, and even just in my experience over the last, well, 20 years here and almost, you know, like probably 25, 30 years almost in the other places I've been, I remember starting off that way too, sending out these black and white photos to media representatives, and you, you got to put them in the mail. And then, then that wonderful thing called FedEx came along, and you could actually, you know, get things there. As the old ad used to say, you can absolutely positively be there overnight. Yeah. And so you could get stuff to people that much more quickly. Um, also, back in the day, um, seeing that my father was the tourism director. He had me and my two brothers were cheap labor for him. Um, we used to they used to take out little ads like print ads in newspapers and magazines, and so it was one of those little forms that you tear out you, and you write your name, address, and phone number on it to request tourism information because the internet didn't exist back then. You know, you, you might have had a toll free number possibly, um, but for the most part, you you filled, clipped these, took these what we called labels, these little. Labels, you filled in your name, address, and phone number, you mailed those to the tourism office, and then they would mail you information in return. Well, when we were kids, you know, in order to get a better rate for the state, you know, my father would have us sort of manually sort them by zip code. And so um, we'd get all these little labels, and so you'd start off with, okay, all the, and you'd, you'd, all the, zeros, the, the zip codes that were zeros, ones, twos, threes, etc. first. And then once you did that, now you take the zeros and you say, now I need the zero one, zero two, zero threes. Now I need the zero one two, zero one one, zero one three, et cetera, et cetera. So we would do that. He'd pay us like, I don't know, 50 cents an hour to do this, which was great when we were like kids. But he would get us to do all these labels for him. He could just bring it back to his secretary. She could like input them into, you know, type them into the, uh, 
you know, in, on the typewriter onto labels, and they could mail them out. And that was how a lot of information was sent out. It was just you, you request it by mail and, and, and do that. Now, I mean, you know, even our campaign has evolved over the years. In the last 20 years that I've been there, you know, we started off with toll-free numbers being very important. Um, you know, so we, at one time, the main office of tourism had about 150 toll-free numbers that we had, um, you know, and all of them directed back to our call center. And, uh, you know, and that's how people would request information. The nice thing about that is you would put a unique toll-free number in each ad so you could track you know, what publication it came from. So, okay, the, the Down East Magazine ad might be 1-800-635-7744 or whatever, you know, and so you could track it that way. Um, then, after the phones kind of, we still use the phones for a number of years, but then we switched to um, sort of unique URLs and websites. So for a period of time there, we had the mainattraction.com, mainattraction.net, mainattraction.org. And so, again, same thing, like the mainattraction.org was like the TV campaign, and the mainattraction.net was the print campaign, or whatever. so you could sort of track it that way. Um, so that was interesting. You know, now, if you look at our ads, you're not going to see a toll-free number on them. Um, you'll more likely see a website you know, and that's probably about it. You might see a hashtag, something along those lines. Um, so it has changed quite a bit during the time. Yeah, I think it's really entertaining to hear you talking about how you sorted those uh, labels. And then actually, yeah, the secretary typed them onto a label master. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. probably your dad used a Mimeo machine to make copies of the fo- of the press releases because it was before photocopiers. Even. Yeah, and my father was always, you know, again, old school. He worked in a newspaper for a while, so it's kind of like manual typewriter, bang, 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 bang. That's how he typed things out, yeah. manual typewriter. And he's, I think he still has one at home. I think he finally got an electric at some point at home. He does use a computer now, though, even though he's 94. Wow. He, he, is, he is using the computer now. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to continue in just a moment with Steve Lyons, but now it's time for our book and things to do pad giveaway. Steve probably has one of these pads on his desk. I think I might have seen one I, recently. Yep. But, uh, yeah, people who have lots of things to do love these pads, even if they write stuff down after they've completed it, just so they can have the pleasure of checking it off. <laughs> so if you'd like to win uh, the book PR Works, my book, PR Works, or one of our things to do pads, go to prmaven.com slash giveaway and you could be our next winner. So we'll be back in just a moment after we hear about the Marshall Plan. Effective marketing is all about targeting your ideal audience with your ideal messages and your ideal media. That's the idea behind the Marshall Plan 65-step process. We have refined and tweaked the Marshall Plan process over the past 20 years because we aim to help our clients to come up with a strategy for their marketing that identifies their ideal audience, messages, and cost-effective media to connect their messages with their audience. For example, if you're running a McDonald's franchise, you probably don't want to target vegans. And if you have a vegan restaurant, you probably don't want to target people who love McDonald's. So that's the process we go through. We get up in the helicopter and we fly around together and look down at your business and come up with the best strategy and ways to measure your success. Check out MarshallPR.com and learn more about the Marshall Plan. And thanks for listening to the PR Maven podcast today. Each year, nearly 1,000 bicyclists are killed in motor vehicle accidents. This time of year, more cyclists take to the roads. We ride for many reasons, for our fitness, for fun, or to raise funds for a great cause. When you see a cyclist on the road, please remember to slow down and respect their space. I'm Lindsay with The Trek Across Maine, and I wanted to share this message because the idea of fewer accidents on the road from distracted driving is a breath of fresh air. This public service announcement is brought to you by the American Lung Association. Welcome back. Today we're talking with Steve Lyons, Director of the Maine Office of Tourism, and I want to dive right back in with some more questions. 
Steve, over the years, you have worked with travel writers, social media influencers, and the main hospitality industry statewide to grow a large network of what we call brand ambassadors. How do you coordinate the messaging so it all reinforces the overall brand? Well, you know, that's kind of a good question, and, and I, think it's, I think it's evolving, frankly. Um, you know, what's important here when you're working with influencers, in my mind anyway, is that not to dictate what you want them to do necessarily. I mean, you want to give them sort of an overview of what you're trying to accomplish in your brand. But for the most part, the reason people, they're influencers, is because they've developed a following for whatever style or subject matter or whatever it is that they're working on. And if you try to tell them, you know, dictate what to do, you know, then it, they lose their own voice. And so there is a balance there. Um, you obviously want to stay on brand, but you also can benefit a lot from these people who, as you said, are ambassadors. And they're telling, again, it goes back to the PR we were, uh, story we were talking about earlier. You know, these are third-party endorsers, essentially, for, for your office. And if you can uh, find someone with a following of 100,000 people or 200,000 or a million followers, and you can get them to present main to their audience the way they would normally present whatever to their audience, then I think that's more beneficial than necessarily being strictly on brand all the time. I think that's just, you know, how I kind of look at it. Right. Well, I'm glad you recognize that because obviously journalists, they they are their own people. They're going to tell their story in their own words. And as soon as you try to tell them what to say or do, <laughs> they're not going to come anymore. So... <coughs> Excuse me. They'll be going to, to New Hampshire or Vermont. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, I just think it's important. I mean, you, you know, you, you want to give them guidance. I mean, you want to say, well, here's what we're trying to accomplish and kind of give an overview. But it is, if you, you know, I, you know, I still believe that you can maybe um, get further along if you let them do their thing the way they've always done it because that's why people are reading their stuff. If, if people suddenly saw that they were being told what they should write, they probably, the people would, their visitors would probably move on to another blog or whatever it is or another influencer or what have you. Right, exactly. Tell me more about Maine's brand platform of originality and how it has worked in the marketplace. Um, the platform of originality has worked very well for us in the marketplace. I mean, we've seen um, extensive growth in what we're doing. I mean, our, in our visitation growth, is we've seen... Um, in the last five, five or six years, we've seen um, average annual growth of about four and a half percent, which is very high. I mean, this, I think the average around the country is more like two and a half to four percent or something like that. So, for us to be actually, we were at five and a half for a while, four and a half in that neighborhood. Um, we're ahead of the curve um, compared to domestic travel markets elsewhere. So, the, the campaign seems to be resonating with people. Um, you know, it's it. What we've moved away, I guess, in general. Anytime I go to any national conferences for tourism, um, what I hear all the time, lately anyway, is that you know it's it's now about the core personal values. It's more you know it's more psychographic and not demographic. I guess is one way to look at it. You know, so what we're seeing now is that people. Um, it used to be you'd target an audience, and it was like, okay, we're going to target you know women, you know, twenty five to fifty four years old that are married and have household income of one hundred thousand dollars a year, blah blah blah, all that other stuff. Well, the thing about core personal values and the way we're doing our campaign now is that your core personal values stay with you your entire life. I mean, you're kind of brought up a certain way, and that's just how you are as a human being. So whether you're twenty five or whether you're fifty five your core value is the same. And so, um, you know, when we look at our campaign, um, people sometimes say, well, are you going after those millennials or those baby boomers? And they say, no, we're going after our segments, which we, you know, um, which are based on, you know, originality and, and values. And people look at us a little cross-eyed sometimes and say, well, well, you know, what does that mean? You know, how do you advertise? Well, you know, I mean, the, the millennial... Um, can have the same values as a um, baby boomer, 
it doesn't really matter. It's just an age thing, and it's how you reach those people uh, that can change. I mean, obviously, millennials are a lot more active online than a lot of the boomers and those kind of things. So that's what you have to be cognizant of when you're looking at branding, I think. Right. <coughs> well, me. of course, I'm the mother of two millennial sons, and uh, they <laughs> they would tell you that their mother's online a lot more than they are because they wish I would get online. <laughs> Kind of like when when they were little kids, they would be always like, "Mom, get off the phone! Stop talking on the phone!" Um, <laughs> but yeah. I've always been in communications, so <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah, that's just the way it goes. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> Your son probably witnesses you uh, online and on the phone a lot, also. Well, he's actually probably online more than I am, believe it or not, at home. I mean, he's just playing with his friends online. I mean, his his whole social network is now online, which is which is a change. Obviously, yeah. when we were growing up, it was like my social network was my friend next door or down the road or whatever, and we'd get together and go bowling or something. Right? But, yeah. <laughs> you know, now they get together and do video games online and talk by Skype. Right? Yeah. So it's quite different. Yes, it is. It is, but I'm sure that. Uh, the fact that you're engaged in that helps you in your job, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Steve, how do you measure the impact of your marketing, advertising, and PR for Maine Tourism? Um, we measure success primarily by visitation and taxable sales, mostly, is what we look at. Um, as I indicated before, visitation has been going up um, you know, quite quite rapidly over the last five or six years. Um, we look at we look at a couple of different things in visitation. We look at overall visitation, just total people coming to the state. We also set a very specific goal of going after first time visitors, because first time visitors, um, once they've been here, have a tendency to want to return, and so um, we've seen our first time visitation number grow substantially. I, I would almost say exponentially since we started focusing on that, and so that's been a, a, a real benefit for us. Um, we also look at restaurant and lodging taxable sales for two reasons. First of all, it's, uh, it's a good sort of indicator, barometer, of it's, it's direct sales reported to the main revenue service, and so what the state actually collects from people who paid to stay in a hotel or eat in a restaurant. The one challenge you have with that, of course, is that restaurant sales, you know, you and I will go out to eat in our town, own hometowns or whatever, that, that doesn't, that's not tourism, that's just us going out to eat, you know. Um, but uh, but it's, a, it's a good barometer and it helps to sort of keep tabs on whether, you know, whether things are going up or down. I, I look at any kind of research or any kind of metrics and data as sort of a trend. Um, reporters always want the number. They want to know we had 37 million visitors or we had, we raised $600 million in taxes. Well, the way I look at it, we have to give those numbers to the reporters because they want them. But when we're doing our visitation estimates and all those kinds of things, we do it through our research firm, they're estimates. I'm obviously not standing down in Kittery counting every person that comes in, you know, who's coming in. We take a sample online, we get about a few thousand people, and we decide from that how many people total are coming. So the way I look at it from the research standpoint is that you look at the trend over time because we've been collecting data the same way using the same methodology for 10 years. And so regardless of what the actual number is on a year-to-year -year basis, what you're looking for is either an up, down, or flat trend is what you're looking for in tourism. Fortunately, we've been on the upward uh, end of things, and that's been very good for us. So I think it's important to look at it that way. We also do ad effectiveness studies every year. Um, so we actually go out to people who have seen our ads and ask them, well, did this ad have any influence over your decision? And oftentimes we find that it does. So, you know, we are tracking that way as well. Well, obviously, uh, measurement is very important. And as you have indicated, I mean, the administration as a whole is focusing on return on investment. So um, I think that's an important thing to have in mind. I know with public relations, it's always been hard to, to find a way to measure, but um, we try to create a measurement dashboard that looks at different metrics. Yeah, you, and you as, also, as uh, you say, if the, met, if the trends are going upward, you know that the 
ultimately there's going to be more money in the cash registers. Yeah. And while the ad effect in the studies do help out, again, it's not ma- measuring every single ad we're doing. It's kind of looking at core markets, you know, our core markets. Um, if we're only running a few ads in a small market, we don't necessarily measure it there. Um, but we'll measure it in the markets like the New York, the Bostons, the you know, DCs where we have larger campaigns, multi-channel campaigns. Um, you know, because there's always that old saying that you've heard of probably a million times, like, you know, with my marketing budget, well, 50% of marketing is working, wages right. on which 50%, you know. Yeah. Um, I think that there's still some of that out there. It is a little easier to track nowadays um, when you're doing digital advertising, certainly, um, in social media. You can track, you know, a lot more engagement and that kind of thing. Um, but when you're talking about a TV ad, um, if you don't have a new, unique URL or unique phone number or something like we used to have in the past, it's a little more challenging. Um, or, or a billboard. I mean, if you're talking, we do a lot of out-of-home advertising in the Boston market, you know, on the T, you know, on the train lines and that kind of thing. Um, and you can't, there's no real easy way to track that. I mean, you don't know if someone sees that ad how much of an impact it had on their decision to come. Right. And so many times people have to be kind of hit over the head numerous times in diff- different ways. We yeah. used to say you have to assault their senses, all their senses. They have to see it, they have to read it, they have to hear it yeah, many, it's, many times. It seems like I read something a few years back about they have to see it at least three or four or five times before it really makes an, yeah. you know, and, and in different channels, which is why we do a multi-channel campaign. It's why we're on television, in print, on the, you know, at the T-stop, on the radio, right? You know, on, on social media, on social media, and in digital, you know, in digital banner ads. Because eventually, after people see these images of Maine flashing in front of them, they'll say, "Huh, Maine? Yeah, right. How about that? I'd like to try that." <laughs> yeah, so it takes time. <laughs> so, what else would you like to share today with the listeners of the PR Maven podcast? Well, I guess I would say that in general, you know, the way we work at the main office of tourism is very research based you know um, research and data analysis are key to the success of what we do and I would encourage anyone um, who's doing any kind of marketing you know you can't really market until you know what it is you're marketing (laughs) and so you know bear in mind all those things that you um, are trying to accomplish and you know, put it down in a plan and do the research to see is that really who you who's really interested in coming to your uh, uh, to your destination or your business or what have you. I mean, we find that you know we do a lot of research through MRI, which is a MediaMark Research Incorporated, um, where you, you know nowadays with MediaMark you can you can look at I mean the, their sampling is like millions and millions of people all over the country and you know about what shoes you wear, what car you drive, what types of activities you like, all those kinds of things. And all that is available to our ad agency and we can see how that aligns with our core segments. And so um, we look at that analysis um, all the time. You know, uh, the other thing I guess I would keep in mind is that you know the main office tourism has chosen to do a lifestyle approach to marketing. That's not the only approach you can do to marketing. Um, it's a growing approach. Again, as, you, as the trends out there are sort of all pointing to destinations that are looking at. Um, lifestyle choices as opposed to just marketing the skiing or the golf or the you know snowmobiling or what have you you know it's actually um, marketing the experience and and what are you going to get out of it as a visitor you know personally gain out of that um, as a result of of visiting the state and so we're looking at that a lot um, sometimes you know being in the state tourism office you frequently get people who say well I don't see any ad about you know um, whatever it is, make something up like hotels or B and Bs, and or I don't see an ad about whale watching. You know, well, you know, it's very difficult for us to um, advertise every segment. I mean, there must be twenty five, thirty, or thirty, or fifty, or more yeah. different segments of tourism in the state that right. you could. You know, if you spend all your time trying to do an ad for each and every one of them, you would never be very effective because you'd be reaching all these niches once. And so, you know, I think the broader approach that we've used over the years has been very important, and it's been very successful for us. Well, I think you've got a really comprehensive marketing program, and I think that this podcast alone has opened up a lot of 
a, you know, a, a window into exactly how numbers oriented your job is. I mean, people must think, oh, that's such a fun job, and they must think it's so glamorous. You must be going around all the time to resorts and casinos and restaurants. But no, I think you're crunching numbers a lot of the time. I, that, that's very true. I yeah. mean, I, I, it is very important. I mean, I think that is a very good distinction to make. I mean, we, you know, what everything we do for advertising, we're not throwing darts at a dartboard, you know. We're, we're looking at things strategically. We're looking at the market, we're looking at people's perceptions, we're looking at trends in the industry, um, we're looking at all these different things and all of that then goes to shape what we do for our campaign. You know, what, what, what is the perception of Maine? What are the people out there? What are the travelers looking for in a vacation? I mean, all these things, you know, what percentage of travelers are interested in this or that or what have you. And, and even uh, we take great pains in our office also to be very inclusive when we're doing our campaigns. You know, we sometimes hear, oh yeah, people already know about lobsters and lighthouses, you know, what about you know, inland? Well, if you look at our campaigns, it's, I, we think it's very balanced and we take great pains to make it very balanced. We'll do emails on a monthly basis and, and with that, um, what we find is that, you know, we're sitting there thinking, okay, well, let's see, this month we have space for four events, but we have eight tourism regions, so we gotta make sure that we did four events from four regions this month and maybe next month it's four different regions and you know and then the articles have to be balanced between inland and 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 coast because you know that's the whole main product you know and so we do that on a daily basis and people may or may not know that but it is something we we are actively pursuing every single day when we're in the office trying to be fair with and and you know show the breadth and depth of what Maine has to offer right well it's very challenging, uh, your job, and I, I respect and admire the work that you're doing. So if members of PR Maven Nation want to follow up, how can they get in touch with you? Um, well, um, if you're interested in tourism information, there's always visitmain.com. Um, if you're interested in reaching me directly, then um, it's steve.lyons at maine.gov, and that's S T E V E dot L Y O N S at Maine dot gov. Sometimes right. people I order pizza or something like, oh, Lions, L I O N S. Yeah, no, right. that's not yeah. it. I don't know anyone in the world named Lions, L I O N S. Maybe there is, but I don't know them. Um, you know, so the best way to reach me is via email, steve dot lions at Maine dot gov. Okay. Well, that's great. And I really enjoyed the conversation today. And I, I want to thank you. And I'm sure PR Maven Nation thanks you too. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Had a good time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the PR Maven podcast. For show notes, links, and guest contact information, visit prmaven.com. If you'd like to connect with Nancy and the rest of PR Maven Nation, be sure to find our group on Facebook. We encourage you to subscribe to the podcast and share our content to bring on great guests with more information. Plus, you can also connect with your target audience, build your network, and build your brand.